What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome back. Um, today, I am super excited to have my friend and friend of the blog, John Gwen, joining me today. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the invite, mate. It's a good day. Absolutely, <laughs> it is a good day. It's the it's the UK release. I mean, you. I, I mean, I, I've heard that you've had a a book release. <laughs> Someone told you, did they? <laughs> yeah, so somebody you know in the grapevine. I've been seeing a few things on Twitter here and there about something about shadows and gods. There's a dragon. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a little bit about that book too. Strangely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I saw something about that. I was like, Who, "Who's this John Gwynn guy? What's he doing?" Um, but no, uh, I mean, you know, super excited for you. It's it's been a it's been I know a pretty big week so far. Um, I mean, clearly it's been a lot of months leading up to it. I know a lot of us bloggers, you know, got a chance to read Shadow uh, a, a couple of months ago, so we've been kind of churning and burning up until until this point. But you've been, uh, I mean, you've been all over the place this week. Yeah, yeah, it's been a really busy week. Um, I'm, which I'm not complaining about. It's been great, um, but pretty flat out. Yeah, lo lots of um appearing on blogs and interviews and chats and stuff it's all, all been it's all good stuff I'll, I'll probably sleep well at the weekend i think but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun now i'm just I'm really i'm just so pleased to see that you know people who are enjoying the book that's that's it's just lovely to see so yeah it's been it's been a great week Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I know you were, I think you did like a crowdcast yesterday with, with KS Veloso or was it might've been two days ago. Uh, and then you were on, uh, that was a good uh and I, yeah. And then you did like an Instagram live, I guess it was yesterday with, uh, uh with the podcast. I mean, just, I just keep seeing your name popping yeah, up and I'm like, book. man, John, John, John must've released a book this week. If he's, you know, showing up in my feet all the time. <laughs> But, um, but John, I've, I just yeah, want to. I've got to say, all the US and UK. Is yeah, they. Uh, I mean, they've been they've been they've been getting after it, <laughs> as, as we like to say. Um, but I just want to want to kind of start us off a little bit. I know I know we've had a chat before, and you know some you know people who you know, are tuning in that maybe didn't see our first one can probably go back and kind of get a little bit more details into it. But just. Kind of tell everybody, you know, a little bit, a little bit about yourself, you know, a little bit about who you are, uh, maybe some of your your past uh, series that you've written, and kind of how we got to where we are today. Okay, um, so well, uh, I write epic fantasy. I've written this is the book that came this week, The Shadow of the Gods, is the first book of the third series that um, that I've been writing. The first two series are. Uh, First one's called The Faithful and the Fallen. The second one's called Of Blood and Bone. They're both set in the same world called the Bashlands. Um, they're all epic fantasy, you know, with um, uh, set in worlds that are kind of inspired by mythology and, and history as well. Um, so that's my kind of writing CV. Uh, as I go, I'm with uh, four kids, three and one girl. Uh, Harriet, James, Ed, and Will, who are wonderful in their own ways, quite demanding in others as well. But they're a great bunch. My wife Caroline and I. Um, <laughs> my wife Caroline and I. We both work from home because my daughter Harriet's uh, profoundly disabled, so we're both her carers. Um, you know, and 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 fortunately, we've both managed to find careers that we can we can do from home. Writing's been a real blessing for us. And, and my wife's career of uh, vintage furniture has also looked after us as well. So, yeah, um, two of my boys still live at home with us, Ed and Will. My oldest, James, he's a dairy farmer. So um, the poor guy is very tired all the time, <laughs> bless him. But, um, yeah, Ed, Ed and Will are at home, and they're both very big book, book lovers. I think I've managed to to um, to brainwash them over the years with, with a, a real love for books, and, and they're both... Uh, on their own YouTube channel these days, which is a lot of fun. And we we're um all 
well, me and the boys, all three of them are keen Viking reenactors as well. So we, we, as you might have guessed from the beard and the uh, the genic. So we, we do that in our spare time. When we can find some spare time, we pick up a shield and a sword and pretend to be Vikings. But really, it's just being big kids again, you know, shaking swords <laughs> at each other. But, so that's that's kind of us. That's, that's the Gwyn clan. There you go. Hey, oh, and I, I forgot to mention, we, we like dogs. Um, my wife's got a horse, and strangely, we have a lamb in the house at the moment as well. But don't even ask about that. Yeah, I, I think I saw. Uh, I think it was Ed that had a had a picture posted when he was reading Shadow and, and feeding the lamb. So uh, I just I just happened to see that over on Instagram a little while ago. Um, yeah, and uh, and Will and Ed are, are killing it with their uh, with their BookTube channel. Um, I know it, it just kind of took off uh after you know just like an episode um and i know they had you on a, a few days ago talking about shadow as well um and it's it's great to see because uh, i know i know they they've talked on blogs i, I think it was i can't remember if it was ed or will or maybe even both have, have written a few things for book nest and um but it's it's really neat being able to, to, to see their booktube channel take off so um so i want to i want to know you, you, we, we've talked a little bit about your your reenacting and uh, I, I want to know about your first experience with the Viking reenactments uh, and kind of how that experience has, has, has maybe changed you over the years and, and how you've maybe gotten into a better reenactor. <laughs> okay. Well, the, so the, the first time I went along to Viking reenactment with, um, with my boys, we, we just, we just turned up, we saw, we saw the group reenacting somewhere locally and had a chat with them afterwards and they invited us along to one of their training sessions so along we went it was um it's always on the on the downs i live live fairly close to the south downs on the uh, south coast of england and um so which is great fun you know training in the open but um when we got there they they just i got a, a, a round battered shield handed to me a uh, uh, an iron helmet and a spear and then they proceeded to teach teach us the you know the the very basics of shield and spear work, which is awesome. But uh, um, it's it's amazing really um, what you learn from doing it. Just a little bit of reenactment. And that first experience, you know, I I always thought I was reasonably fit, um, but after 15, 20 minutes, like the burn in your shoulder from from holding a shield, and um, and just keeping it in that position while you're while you're trying to do the basic strikes, it got to the point where I just had to step step out of the combat and, and just put my arm down because I couldn't hold the hold the um, shield up any longer, you know. So um, that was my first very first experience, and it and it really struck me, you know, how there are so many small details that you can pick up from the Viking reenactment that that are really helpful to um. You know, to just add layers to 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 the way I write combat. Another another story, actually, and and it just goes to prove that being a being a Viking reenactor doesn't just it doesn't does it doesn't just teach you the stuff that you can use to write kind of badass warriors. You know, it teaches you the other side of it as well. So I was at a um, the reenactment of the Battle of Hastings, and I was looking to buy a coat of mail. I um, thought it's about time I got some, and there was a traders traders stalls there, traders fair. So I I tried on this coat of mail, and I got it o over my head because you have to kind of slither into it. The, you know, there's no, you don't buckle it up or anything. It's one piece, and you just kind of slot into it, and you slither into it like a snake. Well, I slithered so far, and then it got stuck, <laughs> and literally I had my hands in the air. I couldn't, it was, there was just mail all around me, around my head. I couldn't see. I could hear though, and all I could hear was laughter. <laughs> I, first of all, my family, but then the laughter grew. So yeah, that was, that was, that's another experience that's, um, that's stuck in my mind. And, and most books now I try to put in a little reference to, uh, to people getting stuck in the mail or how it's not actually that easy. No, it's it's not as easy as you'd think being a Viking. <laughs> I say it sounds like trying to get you know like a 
like a sweatshirt on or something that maybe like the head holes maybe gotten a little bit smaller since you, since you last washed it. You just sit there trying to kind of <laughs> crane your head a little bit exactly. to get to it. Yeah. Take, <laughs> take that and times it by 800, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. It, I'm not, hopefully, I've, hopefully I've worked it out now, but the, that first one was, that was hilarious <laughs> and humiliating. <laughs> But I say it, it might be even more humiliating now, like if it were to happen to you, like, you know, now a couple of years down the road, you know, <laughs> you just, you just get out there and you're trying to yeah. slither into it. And everybody's just kind of, just kind of crossing their arms, just kind of watching you. <laughs> I was like, he'll, he'll get it. He'll get it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. You know, you were talking about how kind of getting in the midst of it and doing your reenactments kind of helps you a little bit more with, you know, kind of getting the feel for combat. Um, Cause you know, your name is kind of synonymous with, with combat and how realistic it feels when you're reading it. Um, and uh, we were talking a little bit off camera, but I, I just finished the Pariah by Anthony Ryan. Um, and while his isn't really Norse inspired, um, it kind of has that same dirt, mud, grit feel of, you know, you being right in the middle of a battle, um, you know, and there's just, there's, <laughs> there's swords going everywhere, horses galloping through, you know, shields, uh, axes going all over the place. And, you know, what, you know, I guess, do you feel like that has really, really helped you in the combat sense? Or, you know, has your ability to read, you know, historical, you know, battles and so forth been the main key about how you kind of get your sense of, you know, what steps to take, arm movements, etc.? Um, well, I'm really pleased that you feel like that about, about the combat scenes, David. That's, that's really great to hear. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's, I think as far as reenactment goes, it, def it definitely has helped me to, to um, you know, add layers and details and some, hopefully, what I feel is authenticity to um, to my combat scenes. But in saying that, I was, you know, I, I was writing long long time before I started doing reenactments. I did, I've, I've been doing reenactments only, um, I don't know, five, six years, something like that. So, um, and, and obviously a lot of, you know, uh, most of writing is imagination. So I, I've, I've put some of, some of how I combat down to just some um, stuff I've soaked up over the years, you know, from being a kid and watching all those movies with my mum and dad, you know, like Spartacus and, all, all those kind of epics growing up on that. And then, um, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this, I've been asked similar questions actually to this about combat lately. And so it's made me think about it a bit more. And I think one of the the kind of um, pivotal moments for me is of how I try to approach writing combat is when I'm, I went to see the film Braveheart before, long before I was writing or thinking of writing, was back in 95, I think, when that came out. And at, at the time, um, it was, felt like it was quite groundbreaking to me because most of the films that I've seen that were, all, that were out at the time that were of a similar nature, you know, whether they were historical or fantasy with, with swords, um, they had that Hollywood gloss, you know, it was, uh, it was very much, you know, choreographed, um, skillful sword work uh, and um, and kind of very clear kind of good and bad and and what, when I watched Braveheart it was like it was a bit like um, you know that opening battle scene in Saving Private Ryan the same kind of feeling you know it just felt like oh my word there's there's no glory here there's no gloss it, war and combat is is horrible and chaotic and frenzied and terrifying. You know, it felt like that you were standing with those guys in, you know, in their battle line. And it was just this kind of kaleidoscopic melee of, of images fly at you. And that, that, I think, stayed with me. And when I write, that, that was kind of the, the foundation stone of how I try to approach combat, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one or you know, tens of thousands. Of the kind of that—that's my attempt to write combat. So you know, you never know how how well your writing is going to 
kind of come out, but that's what I strive to do anyway, is, is write scenes that have that same kind of sense to them. Another, another one that I, I often mention as well is, is The Revenant, um, that opening mm -hmm. battle scene, the fight scene The Revenant. You know, had that has the same kind of feel to me of how I try to write combat. You know, that's how, at least that's how I see it in my head. I don't know if it comes out like that on the page, but you know, just that that, that frantic melee is going on all around you, and you know, the fear and the chaos and the adrenaline. Um, and then, of course, doing Viking reenactment on top of that, I think it's just helped me to. Um, to add layers to that, you know, and details, hopefully. That's what I try to do anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like here, I mean, I've only been reading for so long and watching, you know, kind of like war type movies, but, you know, I feel like that whole dark versus light has kind of grayed more. Uh, and then when you, when it comes to actual like battles, I mean, yeah, you still have winners and losers for the most part, but I feel like everybody pretty much gets their due on the battlefield. Like everybody's getting beat up and hammered down and, you know, they're on the ground and they're, you know, about to get, you know, the final blow and somebody comes and says, like, I feel like everybody kind of feels it. You know, you don't have a bunch of people going through, you know, coming off unscathed, <laughs> like, oh, he went and killed a hundred people on the battlefield and, oh, he didn't even get a nick. I don't feel like that that's really happening anymore. I feel like everybody is, is getting right down into it. Uh, whether or not you've, you know, whether you've held a sword for five days or, you know, 10 years, you know, I feel like, you know, you, you signed up for it, you get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's so true. I mean, you you go to a long-term reenactment um, session, and you usually come home with a bruise or an ache somewhere. You know, it's just not realistic to to come through any kind of combat unscathed. <laughs> I don't think it happens. But to say you set up a shield you know, wall a and you just kind of stand back and stand back and watch. Like, no, you guys, you guys got it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you kind of, you know, since your first two series, um, has your writing process changed at all with this new series? Uh, I mean, I know you just finished book two uh, and you've handed it off to your editor. So like, have you felt like you've kind of kept the same, you know, plotting or pantsing style that you've had since the beginning, or has it really evolved since maybe you finished the Faithful and the Fallen series? Uh, to, to be honest, it's probably stayed fairly similar all the way through. Um, I think, you know, I, I feel a bit more confident about about the way I go about it. But the actual process is pretty similar from from when I started Malice, you know, right up to, to the way I'm writing now. I, you know, I, um, I mean, as far as whether about being a gardener or an architect, I, I kind of think I'm somewhere in the middle. You know, and I've always um, done some plots, writing, uh, you know, kind of more heavy plotting for book one and then basic plotting for, for the, the books that follow, whether there's four books, three books in the series. And I do, the way I do that is I, I think of the events that I, that I can see happening, you know, after mulling over the story and brainstorming over it for a while. I get to a point where I have like a series of events. And so I'll, I'll kind of jot those down and then I'll craft the characters. Usually um, I'll try and think of characters that, that would be interesting perspectives to see those events from. And then I kind of let the characters loose towards those events. And, but how they get there, they kind of, I work that out on the way, you know, that's, that's the kind of the gardening part for me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and I've done that really all the way through. That's the way I, I, I approach e each book. I mean, it feels like you know I'm, I'm getting a bit more comfortable with it and not feeling like I'm just stumbling my way through. Um, I do a lot. I do a lot of research because all everything I write is um, is historically inspired and mythologically inspired. You know, I don't I don't want to copy mythology or history, but I use the kind of um, 
inspirations for leaping into the world's own medicine. So there's always a lot of that. I spent a lot of time, you know, looking at kind of historical texts and and mythological stories and that, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, the, yeah, that's pretty much the way I got it. <laughs> but I say, it's probably it's probably better to do inspired rather than retellings because I mean it can get pretty pretty ugly and dark if you if you go straight by the texts. Because uh, you know, I've seen I've seen yeah. some you know fairly close retellings of historic events and and myths, and it's it's not it's not really that pretty. <laughs> no, history is never pretty. <laughs> it's usually pretty tragic. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Absolutely. I don't I don't want to copy mythology. Or, you know, I, I, I'd like to be inspired by it. You know, it's like in the new series, the the Blood Water. It's very heavily Norse inspired, and you'll see kind of tips of the hat to to Norse tales and Norse gods. But you haven't got Odin and Thor and Loki in there. You know, uh, uh, there is the new pantheon, but um, just kind of hope, hopefully respectful of of Norse mythology and and just kind of tipping a hat to it. That that's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, now now that you, you're kind of steeped into into like Norse, uh, you know, mythology and doing reenactments and so forth. What do say TV shows like Vikings, uh, you know, and so forth? What do they do? They get more things wrong than they get right as far as as being, you know, inspired or or kind of retellings. Yeah, um, the show. Is yes, <laughs> they, they get more wrong than right. I think. I mean, I, I really enjoyed Vikings. It's a lot of fun. The, the TV show, it's, a, it's great fun, but not. It's not historically accurate. You know, it's not. It's loosely based on the the sagas of R Ragnar Lodbrok and his sons. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a bit of kind of Norse history thrown in there as well with Harold Finehair. You know, the, the first king of Norway. But it's really um, all the details are just for 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 TV and visuals, you know. I mean, um, yeah. any any Norse warrior would not go into battle without a helmet, without wearing a helmet. You know, that's that's <laughs> your, your your head is the bit you want to protect the most, <laughs> right? Because if you get stabbed in the body, you you might live, but if you get stabbed in the head, the chances are you're not going to be getting back up. So um. You know, the first piece of kit that that a, a warrior who knows who knows their craft will be a, will be a good helmet, and in Vikings, no no one wears a helmet, <laughs> and they all I mean, wear leather. Not, not a Most single one. <laughs> no, no, but you know, so but it, you know, I think it's for TV because obviously you all start wearing helmets, and then you don't recognise who to do and and so on. So they they make these these um tweaks for, for TV and it's you just got to take it for what it is which is fun I, you know and I really enjoy it <laughs> as long as you don't get too I can, upset I can just about, imagine yeah. I can just imagine you sitting there going this this isn't this isn't how they did it that I don't this is this is not a, this is not please me <laughs> there are, there is, there's a lot of reenactors and historians that get upset about that kind of stuff you know oh I bet but <laughs> So, um, do you? Uh, I'm assuming have you have you watched uh, like Cornwell's The Last Kingdom? Um, and I'm sure I'm sure you've read his his novels as well. I mean, I I, I think I remember you talking about him, him being you know somewhat of an inspiration or influence of yours. Um, but I mean, you know, I, I feel like his is a little closer. Granted, you know, a majority of his Vikings also don't wear helmets, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. I'm, I'm a huge Bernard Cornwell fan. I love Bernard Cornwell's writing. Um, yeah, he's 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 one of the the kind of when people ask me who are my inspirations, he's one of the big three for me that inspired me and who I aspire to write even remotely like would you know would make me very happy, um, along with Tolkien and Gemmell. But um, Bernard Cornwell's uh, his series on King Arthur called The Warlord Chronicles is one of my all time favourite series. 
you know, I've read it many times and I weep every, okay. every time. I found this on the web for series on King Arthur, <laughs> all time favorite series. Check it out. <laughs> right, Perfect <Steve>. timing. <laughs> <laughs> He's not invited to this conversation. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, Bernard Cornwell um and his King Arthur series, especially, but I love the, the Last Kingdom series as well. Utrid, I think, is just one of those iconic oh. characters. So so good. And the series, I think, is you know, I've really enjoyed this series. You know, I'd say more than Vikings, and it, I think it is more authentic than Vikings. But again, you know, it's not it's not completely authentic. There's a lot of things they do differently. You know, like um, so so the uh, the Danes and, and the Anglo Saxons, they'll the, the Anglo Saxons, they give them rectangular shields. Again, it's I think it's just so you can tell who's who and who's on what side but they didn't use rectangular shields they use round shields the same as the danes and the vikings you know so um and they all would have worn helmets as well and obviously, obviously of course each has got a sword that he wears across his back which made a lot, made a lot of uh historians just collapse in horror <laughs> Because that was I know I know I know Christian Cameron is one that would be like you, that would never work. <laughs> I, I could just like hear him saying no. it now because I know we talked about it during TBR con. He's like, you can't have a sword on your back. You can't get it out. If somebody pins you up against no, the wall, exactly. you're dead. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Exactly. There's no getting that thing out. If if, if you've got a sword of that length strapped to your back, <laughs> it's going to stay in its cabin. <laughs> you just won't get it out. <laughs> Apparently, only Geralt the Witcher can wear it on his back because he just looks cool with it. Apparently, so <laughs> it, does look, it does look very cool. And I think with Geralt, they've the guys behind um, the show they've designed a scabbard where there's a cutaway down one side. I mean, of course, the scabbard here. So here's my Viking sword. But they in the, in the Witcher, I think they've got a cutaway here down one side of the scabbard, so mm -hmm. that the sword will. Or kind of, you can draw it and pull it out of the scabbard that way. So it's a, it actually is, doable. but but it was never a thing historically. You know that. Yeah. That, that it just wasn't. But it looks it looks very cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it and it, and and it totally beats like having to wear it around your waist and it knocking against your leg. You know, it just gets annoying, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. There are historical swords that you know could be worn on your back, but they're much shorter. Um, you know, I think like uh, uh, ninjas, for example, had shorter swords. You know, and um, I think you, you can see them wearing them on their backs. But but a, a sword of average length is just yeah. too. The physics is too long. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I'm yeah. thinking of well, like no, you know you have to really be able to like straighten your arms to be able to, you know, get anything of length off of your back. But yeah, it just, and you know, I know I, I watched, uh, I watched Christian's writing fighting videos that he posts and he talks about actually, you know, drawing a sword, even from the front, you've actually got to pull it out a little bit before you can actually unsheathe it because it gets stuck and nobody talks about that. Everybody just talks about unsheathing a sword and yeah. going after it, but that's not actually accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, Christian, Christian's amazing. Uh, he, he is just a constant source of information. You know, he, he's a, a real great guy to go to for, for those authentic details because he really knows his stuff. And he's Absolutely. such a nice guy. You know, he's, yeah. 100%. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about – I guess we'll talk about your new book, right? Why not? Um <laughs> <laughs> so uh so the shadow of the gods so it came out uh this tuesday the fourth uh in the states and it just came out today the sixth in the uk um i mean i have i just keep hearing amazing things about it i clearly have read it i read it a while back and i thought it was wonderful it's actually my top read so far of this year um but uh tell people a little bit about it um and then we'll kind of go from there Oh well, first, I mean, thanks, David, for for you know your kind words about 
uh, Shadow of the Gods. I'm so pleased you enjoyed it. This really means a lot to me. So that's, that's great to hear. And, and yeah, so it, this is the beginning of a an entirely new series set in a new world. It's very heavily inspired by Norse mythology and my, my kind of love, nostalgic passion for Norse mythology and my kind of adult love for Viking era history. Um, and so you, one of the, the starting points is Beowulf, the, the story of Beowulf, who was uh, th that guy who uh, led a band of monster hunting mercenaries. Uh, and that, that's a big, a big kind of uh, flavor for uh, the world of the Bloodsworn. Um, it's also heavily inspired by Ragnarok, you know, that in Norse mythology, that end of day battle where the Norse gods fought each other to extinction, you know, where Thor faced up to Jormungandr and Odin against Fenrir, the wolf and so on. And they all basically annihilated each other so that pretty much most of them were dead on the battlefield uh, uh, by the end of it. And so that that's kind of a, an inspiration for a starting point for for this series which is um it's fantastical but it's also you know hopefully feels like a, a an authentically historic kind of viking era world and so in this world of the blood swarm the um the gods are dead they fought themselves to extinction but their bones still scatter the world and there's magic and power in their bones and also um they they sired bloodlines when they were alive so the those humans who are alive who still have you know a, a touch of god blood in them are um are capable capable of doing things that um that the gods could do so they they so for example um one of the gods was uh bursa the bear god and so his offspring are, are my inspiration for berserkers um you know if you've heard of the norse berserker that's kind of my origin story, my take on their origin story. So they've got a touch of of the bear in their blood, and they they can uh, manifest, you know, strength and frenzy power and, and that kind of thing. And then there's another god who is a hound, and so uh, his descendants are, are, are great trackers. But these people, um, they they are hated and reviled because the survivors, the human survivors of this cataclysmic war, hate the gods now because of almost destroying the world and so they hunt um down the blinds of of the gods so they call them the tainted they hunt them and either kill them or enslave them and use them um in their own kind of small quests for power so it, it says it's hopefully the idea is it's a small world in its infancy where where humanity is kind of having these petty struggles and these um it, it it's a quest for power for um who can rule the land and but it's split into warring kingdoms warring realms um and there are mercenary bands like the blood sworn um who are hired they're like warriors for hire to go and find these gods and the tainted these offsprings um because they there's uh they're paid well for it so that's kind of the starting point for for the series with all those elements thrown in and then um you know hopefully it'll be a lot of fun i've really enjoyed writing the first book it's, it's been great fun actually i've re really really enjoyed it it's felt like a you know a kid in a sandbox just um inventing new stuff because i've tried to make it feel very different from my first two series the banished lands um uh, make it feel more norse and I've, I've tried to do that by soaking up a lot of Norse mythology and history. And I've put in a, a, a lot of monsters. <laughs> There's a lot more monsters than I've put in my other series. And there, and some of them have made up and a lot of them I've taken from Norse mythology, but I've tried to find ones that are, um, you know, scratched between, beneath the surface. So they're not, there are trolls, for example, and there is a dragon, but there's a lot of other creatures that hopefully you, you might not have heard of that are um, quite fun to write and quite unpleasant in their, in their own ways. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's um, the blood swan. I think my publishers, the, the, when we spoke about it, I kind of described it to them as um, Vikings meets the Witcher, you know, because with that, that kind of the Viking era feel, but with uh, monster hunting, 
uh, and a very dangerous world to live in. So that that's that's it in a nutshell. I mean that it's a pretty good. I mean <laughs> that, that would sell me, and it and it felt really like that. And I will say though, I, I did while I was reading, I was like waiting on this dragon to come out, you know, because because you know we all saw the cover, and I was like, there's a dragon in here somewhere. I just know there is, and it well pays off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad you feel like that. You have to wait a little while before you before you uh, get to that. But she is in there for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and she's big. <laughs> um, so I want to know: uh, Can you, for for those who have read, uh, you know, your previous series, Fateful and Fallen, um, and so forth? What is the, I guess, the differences between the Banished Lands versus what we're on now, which is the Battle Plane? Um, so the difference is, um, I I think um, I've I've approached the the battle plane, um, Vigrith, this this new world. Um, it I think it's less sentimental. Is probably the best way. There's um, I mean, there's you know, I will always write about family and friendship and love and you know those bonds and kind of those choices those moral choices that, that will always be part of what i write but um i th i think it's more obvious in the banished lands than it is in the battle plane um you know the the characters may be a little bit grayer um a little bit more self serving or self-interested on the whole i mean you know there's still strong themes of family and friendship in there but they're they're just I think grayer, and I think the world feels a little harder, harsher, colder, more dangerous than the Banished Lands. The Banished Lands was inspired by I wanted it to feel like an alternative mythical slash historical um, ancient Europe, you know, kind of inspired by Celtic Romano times, um, and as as the Banished Lands grew. Then I think spring as well, but um, but the the new series with the battle plane that it, it starts off in in a, a country one country so it's kind of the smallest smaller focus it's it's not quite not quite as on a bigger scale geographically, um, and it hopefully feels just very very Norse that that's what I wanted to do and and it's going to spread its wings a little bit as as we go through the books uh, and you know there will be elements from other continents and other countries and other and, and and varying cultures but it starts off as a smaller more intimate tale i think than than the, the banished land series which is bigger in geographically in scope and also with the po points of view um malice i think had seven points of view um, my the first book in the Vanish Lands, and this has got three, so I, I think it feels you know maybe a more intimate tale as well. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I always like the the chapters where you know you take a different character and you kind of get their journey, and then you know they all kind of climax. And yeah, I, I think it's a little bit more of an intimate tale, and it is very Norse, so you, you definitely can check that off. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, but, but I want to ask, um, what was what was the inspiration behind Orca, um, and why did you decide to you know bring this? We're just going to call her badass female character uh, into the fold. I mean, she she is really the character that has has stuck with me since I finished the novel, um, and clearly based on the ending of the book, and looking forward to in the next book. Um, but what was like her inspiration and, and what was it that made you like, okay, I've got to make her, you know, a focal point in this, in this tale. Okay. So, um, I was saying earlier on, that I usually start off with, with my, with a new story with events and working out some events that, that I, I start to I kind of frame things around and that's usually how I work, but, but Orca or the, that character and it, when when I started thinking about that character, it wasn't necessarily male or female. I was just thinking about the character. She she was there right from the beginning. Um, from you know the first day that I was 
thinking about what am I going to write next? And that's because I like to play with tropes. I mean, I, I like tropes in fantasy. I, I know some people think they're a swear word these days, but um, <laughs> I think if you write a trope, if you write a trope with with a fresh twist, you know, and, and just make it contemporary and maybe subvert it in some way, then um, then that I enjoy books that, that, that you find that in and I write what I want to read. So, that you know, I, I like using mm -hmm. tropes. Um, and so Orca started off as that, as that trope of the, the retired person of violence. So very much like, um, very much like William Money in Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood, you know, the, the, that that person that's put their violent past behind them and settled down. Um, and I remember speaking to my agent, Julie Crisp, and telling her about my, you know, the, my the very first seeds of the of the story, and we were talking about it. And I said, I want, you know, the, this character to to be kind of central to the story. And we were talking about it backwards and forth. And one of us, it, it, I think it was probably Julie, said, "Well, you could make her a woman." make the character female and uh, and that was i thought that's a, that's a great idea it's a new angle you know for that often written trope and that's where orca started um you know but she was she was all I always I, out of all the characters I've written i feel like i knew her the most from the first page you know usually it's it's a process of as you write your character you kind of find their voice the voice becomes stronger as you go through the book mm. and often I'll, I'll do that. And then I might go back, you know, and just tighten up the, the characters um, with the voice that I've established over the duration of the book. But with Orca, she was, um, she was there from the beginning, you know, and, and I remember writing scenes with her in and writing dialogue with her in and thinking, no, you know, this, I'm going to take dialogue out. Um, which usually I'll, I'll do more dialogue and and kind of explain, show show a character through the dialogue. But I think I think I showed more of what she was like by deleting a lot of her dialogue and just keeping it quite um, limited. Um, mm. That that's kind of the character. She you know very focused, very internally. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to quote Mark Lawrence on this, uh, and, and he hits it on the head. And I'm pretty sure I, I talked to him about, about this while I was reading through it. But uh, he said that you won the award for having testicles featured most prominently in a fight. <laughs> and I have to agree. I, <laughs> I don't. I don't think I've ever. I've ever seen that before. And I was like, in a John Glenn book, really? Um, so so ha hats off about that. Um, <laughs> But kind of kind of rolling with that, um, I remember I, I reached out to you. Uh, I think it was right after I read Spick's, uh Troll Story, um, and uh, pe people that are, are watching haven't read the book. I mean, it's it's phenomenal, and I don't want John to spoil it. But I just want to know what was what was the inspiration behind that story? Because it, I, I mean, I, I had to set the book aside. And I was laughing so hard. <laughs> so that, that troll story that again that's that's my tip of the hat really to um to scandinavian folklore because it it's basically it's a scandinavian folk tale uh that's um i think it's well told in uh you know in scandinavia uh kind of like we grow up with um little red riding hood you know i think it's a well-known um folk tale fairy tale and that was a big part of the research that, I, that i've put into this i read a lot of a lot of Scandinavian folk tales, and when I read read the uh, kind of, I mean, I've changed it and tweaked it to suit the story, but the the core of it is still the same. And it, it had me laughing when I was reading it. I thought this this has to be, you know, in my book. So, yeah, that that the, you know, the inspiration for that came from Scandinavian folklore, and they'll I'm determined to put a Svik story in each book. So there's another one in book two. Hopefully Fantastic. you'll enjoy that one as well. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure I will. And I'll probably do the same thing. I'll probably reach out to you again and be like, hey, <laughs> I'm just going to keep reading. Um, well, I mean, clearly, you know, we could sit here and go on and on about the book. And I know 
you know, you have you've had multiple chats about it this week, um, and uh, and I know there's there's people basically just need to read the book uh, is what I'm getting to. But um, I've got a couple of questions from a couple of my contributors that are kind of outside the scope of the book, but um, Neil wanted to know what the inspiration was behind Lycos because I have several contributors on my site that are we'll say less than fans of Lycos. So what was your inspiration behind that character? <laughs> I mean, there was there were really there was no kind of specific person, or you know, fortunately, I mean, I hope I wouldn't want to find anyone like like us really. Um, he, but he was he was he was in the story from quite early on, and I uh, I remember writing a POV from him in Malice. So he was, but I, I took it out in the end and, and saved his POV for for um, book two. I think Valor is where he comes up as a POV. He's in. Malice, but but you don't see things from his perspective in in Malice, but um, yeah, I mean there was it, that that was just my twisted imagination, I suppose. <laughs> I have to hold my hands up to that one. There there is there is no real kind of specific or individual inspiration for him. Just a, a, a generally uh, power hungry kind of self serving guy. I gotcha. Uh, David Schaefer wants to know what your uh, favorite TV shows are. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I love The Last Kingdom. That's one of my favorite TV shows. Love that. Um, what else? Well, I, I have to confess that I have become addicted to The Crown with, with oh, my wife. So we good. I really enjoyed watching. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Um, go on on the spot now. What else do I like to watch? I mean, I like to watch a lot of crime <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, um, I mean, and probably one of my my all time favorite TV shows is um, This Is England. I don't know if you've if you've come across that, but um, you know, I think that's just amazing for uh, for its acting, humanity. It's, it's a stunning show. It covers a lot of really, really deep, grim themes as well, but does it, you know, in su such a way that it really, it's one of those shows that really stays with you, makes you think a lot, you know, it's, um, it's not popcorn entertainment or anything. It's, um, it's serious viewing, but the acting is just so breathtaking. It, um, I recommend it to anyone. I, I heard a recommendation. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I thought I heard your son give you a recommendation. It's it's muttering in the background here. Yeah, yeah. So another thing we we'll watched together um, is there's a couple actually that come to save me on Sky TV, which is a a really great series uh, about a about a dad who has to find his missing daughter. And Tin Star we watched recently with with. Um, Tim Roth, which um, we all thought was was a, a great TV show. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah. Katie, Katie's asking more... in the in the comments if you watch uh, if you watch Bake Off. Oh, that's that's one of one of our mutual favorite shows, along with Ryan Van Loon. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have watched Bake Off. I haven't seen the last few series, <laughs> but we we used to watch it quite a lot. Yeah, but. Oh gosh, it's so great! It's it's just like it's just nice to have on. The music's really calming, and every now and then I have to try a recipe. I actually made yeah. I made a beef Wellington a couple of weeks ago, and I was very proud of it. <laughs> yeah, the trouble with Bake Off is, is if I keep watching it, I won't be able to get into my Viking tunic anymore because it just makes me want to eat. <laughs> just makes you want to eat a bunch of meringue and. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to ask you a question, then I'll, and we'll get to our last one. Um, have you read anything uh, lately that's that just blew your mind, or that you just thought was really great? And you'd recommend? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've had a great run on reading lately. It's one of the ironies of writing that you get less time to read for pleasure, which is which is a shame. But um, 
I have managed to, to read some books lately, and one of them was um, The Prior, which we were talking about earlier by Anthony Ryan, which is uh, I thought was fantastic, really, really great take on the kind of Robin Hood mythos, um, making it feel gritty and, and, and realistic. That was great. Uh, also, Empires of the Vampire by Jay Christoph, um, which oh. is really an exceptional read. It, it, it's, I want it I so mean, bad. <laughs> you can't say enough about it. It, it, it is so, uh, it's, it's almost the perfect novel. You know, it felt a bit like when I read Blood Song by Anthony Ryan again, which which is just one of those books which kind of is is just finally perfect. And uh, Empire of the Vampire felt like that. So good. And I'm reading um, Ben Ben Galley's The Forever King, which is also a great read. I'm really enjoying. That. I haven't quite finished that yet, about two thirds of the way through, but that's a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying that. So yeah, that's my last three. Okay, I mean, it's a heck of a lineup. <laughs> you're you're reading, you know, you've read two of like the most anticipated books of this year. So, <laughs> and then I know I know Ben. Um, I think Ben sent me a copy of the Forever King of Lisa. I've definitely got to get on it too. So. Uh, I'm glad to hear it's really good. I, I, I've read a little sure. bit of Ben's stuff. I read, yeah, yeah. Uh, shoot, what is the name of that one? It was about the Golem. I can't remember the title of it, and Ben's going to kill me if he, <laughs> if he sees this. Uh, but I read it a couple of years ago. I think I I'm two or three years ago. Oh. I'm like blanking. Stoneheart? Stone? Stoneheart? Sure. Stone? Heart of Stone. Heart of Stone. I haven't read that either, but I, I I can see the cover in my head. I, I know what he's talking about. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I said I can remember the cover. Yeah, he's, he's I, right I can right. remember like every book cover, but I can never remember titles. <laughs> um, can right, so, yeah, I know. So last question I got for you. Um, I saw that you just finished book two and sent it off to your editor. I guess it's a two-part question. How long is it? And can you give us any details about it? Whoa. Okay. So Dead God's Rising, book two, Blood Swan, um, it, it weighed in at just over 2,000 words. So it came in a bit bigger than book one. That was about 160,000. Um, and I mean, it's very hard to give to tell you anything about it without giving away plot lines from book one. But I mean, all I can tell you is that hopefully you'll get more and bigger. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, you follow. I've added two new POVs. I've added two POVs in this one, so um, it, it, you know it's. Uh, it, it, hopefully, it's it's the threads are spreading out and you're getting a, a, a bigger feel for the world, um, and for probably the, the politics that are going on. You know, the the um, the bigger picture of what's going on in, in the battle plane. Aside from the smaller personal tales that the book one is framed around, well, those those are still there, um, yeah, you know, because of the way that events play out in, at the end of book one. Um, certain characters are getting sucked into uh, bigger things ag against their wills. Really, they'd rather not, um, because these aren't people that you know are seeing world as. Oh, this is bad, so we need to put it right. They're people that are that are more invested in in looking after that, protecting their family. Um, uh, you know, more smaller scale motivations that, than those bigger bigger ideas, which were maybe in the banished lands of of you know protecting the world darkness. And, well, that, that's still there. popular so, man, but um. <laughs> <laughs> There's just bells and whistles going off everywhere. So <laughs> yeah, you know, hopefully it expands the world. That's what I said it could do. <laughs> Makes things um bigger and ups ups the um ups the scalings and hopefully the the pressure as well. So the conflicts maybe are a little bit bigger that than book one. There's still the separate tales, those those threads running through it, but hopefully it's just it'll it's get getting bigger and meaner. That's the idea. 
Hey, we we always like to hear bigger. So you know, uh, cl- clearly clearly word count is already there. So <laughs> why not why not bring the scale up too? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, John, uh, I really appreciate you being here. Like I said, I know you've had a really busy week, but it's always great to talk to you. Um, and also, you, your beard game is very strong, uh, as well as well as your kit. I really appreciate you uh, coming in full persona for the, for the chat today. Um, and everybody that's that's looking in, so uh, it's already out. I recommend it. It's my number one read so far in 2021. It will probably stay there, but go out and get it. You can get it anywhere. I recommend hardcover, uh, which we don't get in the States, but it, I would recommend ordering it from the Broken Binding um, because they're awesome and you can get a signed copy. Um, and it also kind of somewhat features my blog on the back of it, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> not, not excited about that at all, uh, but uh, it's, it's a phenomenal <laughs> read and I highly recommend it. So definitely uh, pick it up. And John, uh, I I will be, and I know everybody that's already read Shadow of the Gods, be looking forward to book two. Um, and just just thank you for writing. Thank you for just giving us such amazing stories to be able to talk to everybody about. Um, I know, you know, I still see people talking about Faithful in the Fallen to this day, uh, and it's amazing. So just thank you so much. And thank you for having such an amazing family that also loves to share their love for books uh, and just keep doing what you're doing. Oh, thanks, David. That really means a lot. Thank you for reading my books. You know, it's um, I only, you know, I'll only be able to keep writing as long as as people like you keep reading. So, th- thank you. Uh, I really mean that. Absolutely, John. Thanks well, for you uh, me on on your blog as well. It's for yeah. sure, for sure, and uh, and I'm glad to hear that you get a little bit of a break before you start back up again next week. So definitely take some time to rest. <laughs> I will. Yeah, I will. Be good, John. We'll <laughs> talk again. Lot,